Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 275. Ghislaine Maxwell stated in court recently that she had not seen Jeffrey Epstein in over a decade. Well, we know we have the emails that prove that statement false, but now we also have an eyewitness who has come forward and said that he saw Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell together at a restaurant in Palm Beach in 2016. We all know that Ghislaine Maxwell is a liar, but what this does, it adds more meat to the bone, more context, and it goes to prove once again that nothing that comes out of this lady's mouth can be believed. Our article tonight is from the Daily Mail. The author of the article is Barry Averich. The headline, I was sitting next to Bonnie and Clyde of child abuse. Filmmaker tells how after spotting Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell dining in Palm Beach, he began film, he began a film about the pedophile until he was threatened. And we know that that was an M.O. for Epstein and company. They like to threaten journalists. They like to threaten filmmakers. And they wanted to make sure that they were in control of whatever the narrative was at all times. And if you are a filmmaker like Mr. Averich here, well, you're not going to cede control to people like that, especially if you're doing a, an explosive expose on their behavior. So, of course, Jeffrey Epstein would threaten him. It was December 2016 in Palm Beach, Florida. I was having lunch with my family at an upscale restaurant tucked away in one of the many alleys off the famed Worth Avenue when Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were shown a table that was far away from the usual Palm Beach A-listers. That's for sure. Look, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell... They were not sitting around just your run-of-the-mill A-lister. Of course not. They had to have their own little section. They had to be sectioned off in an area where they could talk in private, they could discuss their disgusting deeds, and that they could have a little bit of privacy. So this is the kind of thing that you see at restaurants a lot of times, at high-end restaurants. There'll be certain portions of the restaurant that are dedicated to just housing people like Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell when they show up. Epstein did not want to be noticed, nor did he acknowledge the rich and powerful in the room. Yeah, well, he probably had them all under his thumb already. I had no idea that I was sitting next to the alleged Bonnie and Clyde of child abuse. It was nearly three years before Epstein's death, and eight years after he quietly pleaded guilty to Florida state charges one of two, of procuring minors for the purposes of prostitution. This is a huge failure and a black eye on the legacy media. They did their job so piss poorly that a famous director and filmmaker had no idea who Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell really were. You would think that the legacy media that loves to tear people down would have been all over this case. But they weren't. And then you look around at the people that were hanging out with Epstein, and you start to understand why. Katie Couric, George Stepanopoulos, Mike Wallace, you know, the list goes on of movers and shakers in the world of the news. And these are the people that we're supposed to trust to tell us the truth? These are the people that we're supposed to trust to bring us to a point where we can kind of understand what's going on? Unfortunately, folks, we can't trust them. And it has been proven over and over again. And this right here is just another glaring example of how the legacy media shit the bed. Surprisingly, most convicted sex offenders in Florida are are sent to state prison. Yet Epstein negotiated a brief 18-month sentence housed in a private wing of the Palm Beach County Stockade. Now let's remember, he only served 13 months of that. And most of it, he was out running the streets, 
abusing other girls, acting like Jeffrey Epstein. It was like he wasn't even being punished for what occurred. Not only was it the shitty non uh, the, the non-prosecution agreement, but it was also the fact that this dude didn't even serve any real time in jail. What he did was not time in jail, folks. Might as well have been at a halfway house somewhere. He was a billionaire pedophile with a circle of high wattage friends, and yet his admission of guilt to detestable crimes, including unlawful sex with minors and sex abuse, received very little media attention and were largely unknown to the general public. Again, I can't stress this enough. The legacy media shit the bed. They were absolutely negligent in their job. These girls went to the legacy media. They reported what happened. And nobody, none of these journalists could be bothered to dive in. Well, not until Acosta showed up, right? And then then it was game on. Once they thought that they had a, an in on one of their political opponents, well, it was a, freeding, a feeding frenzy. But what happened leading up to that point? Where was the legacy media? Why weren't they doing their job? Why weren't they making the general public aware of the sort of scoundrel that was moving amongst us? A few tables away at the popular Italian restaurant, a well-known CNBC eatery called Bice Ristorante, I was immediately intrigued by Epstein. Yeah, I could see, I could see why, right? I mean... I know that if I was a documentary filmmaker in 2016 and I saw Jeffrey Epstein at a restaurant, I'd be interested in what was going on and I might even want to talk about doing a project because sometimes that's where, when you're a creative person and you work on creative projects, you get inspiration from all kinds of crazy situations. So I would not be shocked if somebody was having dinner with their family and they're a creative film director and they see Epstein and Maxwell and they decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to do something about these two. I'm going to do a project involving Epstein's criminal enterprise. Perhaps it's the documentarian in me. I needed to know who he was. My wife kept telling me not to stare. The waiters knew what to bring him without him ordering, and his conversation was hushed in an intimate way as he kept his head down. All right, so that's pretty interesting, right? If the restaurants, if the, excuse me, the waiters and waitresses knew exactly what to bring him without even asking him, that means he was a regular there all the time, and that some of the employees there might know a thing or two about Jeffrey Epstein and who he was associating with while he was eating. So it's certainly another avenue to explore. He was deeply tanned, casually dressed, and avoided the prerequisite palm, uh, palm dress code of jungle chick or garish green or salmon-colored pants. And he, he always dressed how he wanted, right? He always had those stupid-ass sweatpants on, those idiotic slippers with the stupid uh, uh, screws on them. He was just an absolute clown, in my opinion. Uh, uh, one of these guys that thought he was way cooler than he was. On the way out of the restaurant, I pressed a $20 bill in Francesco's hand, the white-jacketed maitre d' to get some information. My kind of guy. That's very Italian of you there, Mr. Average. That is exactly how you get information. A nice 20 folded up in your palm. You walk up, shake hands. Then you start asking some questions. But I think that you probably should have put a C note in your hand. His response was a little ominous in his thick Italian accent. That's Mr. Epstein and his girlfriend. I wouldn't bother saying hello. And it's interesting, again, how the public thought of Ghislaine Maxwell as Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend. It was a great cover story for him. People thought he had this girlfriend. It was his, his cover story. And if he has this girlfriend, then, well, oh, come on. The stories about him abusing people are absolutely untrue then, right? Because Ghislaine Maxwell would never allow it. I mean, this, this hoity-toity British socialite, there's no way. Until people find out that she's just as bad as Epstein, that she's just as big of a monster. The minute I returned back to the hotel, I dug into the mysterious world of Jeffrey Epstein. I was astounded by what I uncovered and even more shocked on how he used his political connections and vast wealth to essentially get a slap on the wrist for rape and the sexual abuse of minors. Yeah, I had the same reaction when I started digging into this case. It is very eye-opening. 
when you have no idea like that something like this is occurring and then it all drops into your lap. It was a lot to take in. There has been a lot to go over and it is one of the most disgusting situations that I personally have ever dug into. I don't even understand. Honestly, I truly don't understand how the people in the legacy media at all of these outlets, Fox, CNN, none of these places thought it was a good idea to start an investigative series into Jeffrey Epstein. Who are you protecting? I reached out to Vanity Fair writer Vicki Ward, who had previously interviewed Epstein, and she helped fill in the blanks for me on Epstein's notorious yet shielded rep- reputation. And we all know how I feel about Vicki Ward here, right? Vicki Ward and Graydon Carter, they are very responsible, in my opinion, for what occurred. They should have ran that story. They should not have been intimidated by Epstein. Instead, they sent out a puff piece when they knew the deal, when they had been contacted by survivors. Vicki Ward is not a reporter. She's a faker who so desperately wants to be part of polite society. Not like us. Folks like us, people listening to this podcast, independent content creators, oh, we don't want to be part of polite society. We want to burn it to the ground. If indeed it was Maxwell that Epstein was lunching with, as I believe it was, that would prove to be quite revelatory. Her lawyers claimed in court that she had not been in contact with the disgraced financier, pedophile, in over 10 years. That was later disproved as unsealed documents exposed a continuing long email thread between them. And that was the email that I referred to earlier. Um, look... There are a lot of ties that connect them throughout the years, even when she says they were not associating. And when we have this eyewitness coming forward like this, it is just a backbreaker for Maxwell and her whole entire narrative. If she's lying about this, what else is she lying about, folks? And in my experience researching partners in crime, their perversity and determination rarely dissipates. Yes, they were connected at the hip. They shared a brain, basically. This wasn't a situation where Ghislaine Maxwell was desperately trying to get out of the clutches of Jeffrey Epstein. It couldn't be, that couldn't be further from the truth. She was a co-boss here, folks. I don't think people are understanding that in the legacy media yet. She wasn't just a two-bit player or a madam or some pimp. She was a co-creator of what was occurring. But what would happen next would shake me to the core. The house was... I had my wife drive me to Epstein's house on 358 El Brio Brio Way in Palm Beach in the hopes of getting a closer look. The house was carefully set back behind enormous shrubbery and a huge steel fence that prevented any way to look in. And I, again, I totally understand his desire to go and check out this house. That's what brought me all the way to Zorro Ranch from Las Vegas. I went there because I had to see it for myself. We sat outside for a while and contemplated the lurid crimes and wondered if he was still up to his old tricks. The next day, I walked back to the house and I was beyond shocked. Two young teenage girls were exiting the house. Folks, here you go. This witness is saying that in 2016, he witnessed two young girls exiting the house of sex offender Jeffrey effing Epstein. Are you not embarrassed yet? Florida State Prosecution, Mr. Acosta, Department of Justice, Department of Corrections, and all four presidents that have been around during this guy's watch. Are you not disgusted with yourselves? You should be. They had girl next door looks and were simply dressed in shorts and tank tops. I absolutely had no proof these girls were abused or a part of Epstein's documented seduction of girls from low-income neighborhoods who took his money in exchange for depravity. But I did notice that they had vacant and sad expressions. Uh, this is this is brutal, guys. You know, I hate these kinds of stories. I really, really detest it. And it makes me so mad to know that the legacy media could have done something about this. They could have acted 
and pressured the authorities into action the same way we see now. They waited for so long. So when they come onto TV or they make posts about the Jeffrey Epstein case, they write articles about it, always remember who you're dealing with. I also had a look at the flight manifest of his jet, the media called the Lolita, the Lolita Express, that he used to transport his inner circle and alleged survivors to his private Caribbean island and his wealthy party guests. The names were staggering. I decided then and there that I would make a documentary and try to catch him in the act. I've never heard any of this story before. This is, this is good stuff. And this uh, filmmaker is a uh, my kind of guy, right? sees something like this, knows that he has the resources to act, and and starts, you know, digging in. After consulting with a criminal lawyer, I devised a plan that would include sending a legally aged woman into Epstein's house, but have them appear much younger. I would wire them with sound and hidden cameras and hopefully film him confessing his depraved preferences and potentially soliciting them to find other underage girls. You know, it's crazy. Mr. Average here is more enterprising than the FBI ever was. When you have people that, are, that make films, documentaries and directors and, and independent journalists who are more worried about what occurred at Jeffrey Epstein's and uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's hands, folks, we have a much bigger problem on our hands. This was something he and his partner in crime, Ghislaine Maxwell, allegedly tended to do. I was genuinely concerned about the safety of these women, so I reached out to a retired police detective and a security firm to partner with in case things escalated or became violent. While I was planning my film, the book Filthy Rich was published exposing Epstein's expedited and lenient journey through the justice system. The same book would be the basis of the Netflix series that was recently launched, and that when that that book when it explained all of the the disgustingness that occurred again you would think that the legacy media would be all over it but we hardly heard a thing at the time although salacious and filled with a who's who of alleged co-conspirators the book did nothing to spook Epstein or cause any real interest in the scandal that's because the book didn't delve deep enough right Patterson gave you a very white bread version of what went on sure we got a decent inside look of what happened in Palm Beach and the whole um, grooming situation and recruiting situation was explained but there was no meat on the bone as far as the blackmail angle, the angle that Jeffrey Epstein was being run as an asset, none of the deeper situations of this whole entire case were really dug into. I decided I needed to turn up the heat on the film, and I leaked my plans to make a documentary to the New York Post, page 6. What happened next was extraordinary. I was flooded with calls and emails from Epstein survivors and anti-sex trafficking groups and others actually offering to fund the film. A few of the survivors that reached out to me remained Jane Doe's fearing Epstein but described disgusting behavior that ran the gamut from gang, gang rapes to pathetic pleading for sexual gratification and to forced abuse. They were minors. I Look... I myself have talked with uh, several of the survivors and to hear the stories directly from them, it is just heart wrenching. And if you're somebody that has it within their power to do something, anything, and you don't act after hearing their stories, then you, my friend, are also a piece of shit. One of them told me that Maxwell was present and that she offered cash bonuses if they could procure other girls. Another Jane Doe claimed Epstein threatened to harm her and her family if she ever disclosed what happened. She went back numerous times and was abused each time. The groups that re represented survivors were delirious that someone was finally going to take Epstein down. They recounted frustrating stories of how his well-oiled sex abuse machine was protected and yet not unknown by both journalists and the police. Look, you that, it's not me saying this about the journalists, right? It's not just my opinion. This is a fact, folks. The legacy media failed. They failed them, they failed us, and they failed at their jobs. 
This was beginning to sound like a clockwork orange meets eyes wide shut double bill. A day after the item ran in the post, I received a haunting call from a retired Palm Beach police officer. He warned me that I was playing with fire and that Epstein had the resources and connections to hurt me both physically and financially. He told me that Epstein used private security firms that played dirty. He scared me sufficiently, but in the coming months, I never heard from Epstein. And this was the typical move of Epstein, right? To intimidate people, to threaten people. And to, folks, it is just another crime that can be put into the RICO statutes. This is another issue that should be RICO. They were threatening people, paying people off, intimidating people, and it was just allowed to occur. The authorities knew. The legacy media knew. All of the other enablers knew. And none of them lift a single finger to help these survivors. I continued my research and was uncovering beyond disgusting details about lurid abuse and the gang rapes of so many children. I was horrified that Epstein put on a tuxedo and attended galas with Maxwell and then went home to one of his many houses of horrors and abused children. Nothing satiated Epstein and I was beginning to wonder who the audience was for this film. Yeah, uh, that's, that's something you shouldn't have to wonder about, especially now, because there are plenty of people that would love for your film to come out, sir. There are plenty of people who would love to see you put these people on blast. Regardless of the offers to finance the film through various sources, I wanted a premium studio or streamer to to partner with. I would soon find out that Hollywood at that time, only four years ago, had very little appetite for this film. I wonder why. I wonder why. Hollywood is an effing cesspool filled with abusers, rapists, and sex traffickers. That's not some conspiracy theory, okay? That's not some ridiculous far out conspiracy theory it is a fact as I would make the rounds to the usual suspects the general response was that the infamous Jeffrey Epstein was not in fact famous enough and so without a real hook despite his famous friends and enablers they passed because they were busy protecting those friends and those enablers just like Nancy Pelosi's daughter said folks some of our faves are going to be caught up in this One powerful agent recommended that I partner with a producer who had just been nominated for an Oscar for 13th, a 2016 documentary by director Ava DuVernay. The day I met him, he was in a surly mood. The Academy allowed OJ Made in America to compete despite its television window and it it beat his film. Perfect timing. I pitched the project and he quickly told me he was not going to sully his reputation and follow an Oscar-nominated film with a film about a pedophile. Isn't that nice? What a hell of a guy. I don't want to sully my reputation by talking about one of the biggest problems in the world. So, yeah, you know what? Pound sand, beat rocks. I'm going to make another profile, another film instead. These people are sick. F Hollywood. F anybody who supports the people in Hollywood and all of their loud mouths. Oh, we're me too. We're this, we're that, we're the... No, you're not. No, you're not. You're all sick and disgusting and the only reason any of you ever spoke up and came to the defense of the females that you know or your fellow female colleagues is to rebuild and to fix your own reputations to make sure that you keep your Teflon on. My Uber was longer than this meeting. And this was how the story played out all over town. There was no appetite for a film. One streamer actually said to me, if the guy kills himself, you have yourself a feature. But not now. How prophetic. Again, I don't understand how these, these streamers and these Hollywood studios, they love salacious shit like this. They love digging into politicians and tearing down people who have made money. But in this case, all of a sudden, this isn't salacious enough. All of a sudden, there's not enough there for you to dive in. Not having a pre-sale has never stopped me before. But what was now giving me pause was a combination of the faces that belong to the disgusting stories of grotesque abuse and the innocence and lives this man destroyed and the complete disappearance of Ghislaine Maxwell. 
From what we understood even then, Maxwell was Epstein's well-documented partner in crime, and as we know, she was eventually charged with four counts relating to procuring and transporting minors for illegal sex acts. Well, at least he gets it right and calls her his par- her partner in, uh, Epstein's partner in crime and not, you know, a pimp or a madam. When I finally got her cell phone number from a source, she told me to screw off and hung up. Ultimately, what made me decide to abort this project was that I found it difficult to keep reading the horror stories I look at and look in the eyes of my 12-year-old daughter. Look, I get that 100%. If I had a daughter, if I had children in general, I think this would be a lot harder for me to cover. I think that this would be the sort of thing that I would look at and it would make my just stomach turn over and it would make me sick. But at the end of the day, this is a story that needs to be told. This is a story that cannot be swept under the rug. And this is a situation that must be met head on. I decided to drop the project and make Prosecuting Evil, a more noble film about a legendary prosecutor who successfully successfully prosecuted Nazis. In reflection, it became obvious that making this film or series on Epstein would involve having to do almost the inconceivable task of untangling the devious web of conflict of interests that kept Epstein virtually untouchable for decades. Well, look man, not for nothing, but myself, Jen and Lisa over at the Prince and the Pervert podcast, which is fantastic. If you don't listen to that, you need to do that. That's what we've been doing here. We've been using our own resources, spending our own time to dig deep into this case. So if I was a powerful filmmaker who had a bunch of resources and people offering to make this film, I don't care how depressing the topic is. I don't care how much it's disturbing. I would dive in and I would do my absolute best to bring the truth to the masses. This included his powerful and rich friends, politicians like a circuit court judge who continues to refuse to unseal grand jury records related to Epstein's charges in Florida almost 15 years ago, and people like Alex Acosta, who served in Donald Trump's cabinet with William Barr. Acosta was the U.S. attorney in Miami where Epstein received his shameful plea deal. Barr's father was the headmaster of an elite New York school that hired college dropout Epstein to teach math. I mean, really? How are you a college dropout, but you're getting a job at a, an elite school like Dalton to teach math? I, I know, you did it all on your resume, right? You didn't have anyone helping you out. Darth Barr's dad didn't pull any strings for you or anything, huh? On the day Epstein killed himself, allegedly, I was not surprised. And I do not subscribe to any theory that he was murdered. In fact, I was told by well-placed sources that the jail guards were paid off through his associates to look the other way while he killed himself. Since the Filthy Rich series has premiered, so many people have asked me if I feel I missed the opportunity or made a mistake not pursuing the film. Well, that's fine. You can believe that he wasn't murdered, and that's great. If you're going to believe your well-placed sources, I, you know, I don't know their names. I, I don't believe them. If I can't vet it, I don't believe it, folks, all right? Since the Filthy Rich series has premiered, so many people have asked me if I feel I missed the opportunity or made a mistake not pursuing the film. My response is simple. I am happy with how the story ends. Well, the story is far from over, sir, so you might still have a chance to dip your toes in if you're not being scared, if you're not going to shy away from the hard work. If you're willing to jump in and make a documentary, then I am sure the survivors and everybody else researching the case would be thankful. But what this article really goes to show is that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were most certainly hanging out in the time frame when Maxwell said that they were not. It establishes that she is a liar once again, and it also tells us just how complicit Hollywood was in this whole entire thing. They didn't want to even talk about it. When your Uber ride is longer than your meeting with somebody you're pitching a film to, then you know the fix is most certainly in. 
If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. The link for this article is in the description box. You can also find a link for the GoFundMe in the description box as well. All right, everybody, we will be back tomorrow and we will rock and roll all over again. I hope you all have a great night.